uh, David Kitts. Uh, David is a professor of food science, food chemistry, and toxicology, food nutrition and health, faculty of land and food systems here at UBC. Uh, he teaches undergraduate courses in food chemistry, third year, and a graduate course in food toxicology and risk assessment. Please join me in welcoming David Kitts. Thank you very much, Richard and Colin. And thank you for the opportunity to uh, come and speak to you about our faculty and our program and some of the things that we do. Uh, it is uh, quite exciting to get this opportunity because the Faculty of Land Food Systems, uh, previously known as Agricultural Sciences, is probably is the one of the uh, original five faculties uh, since the initiation of uh, my great campus. And, 1905, 1915, or something like that. So food uh, systems, food production systems have been a, uh, a part of UBC uh, and this campus for a few, for, for uh, decades. This picture is actually one before um, a series of recent graduate students, so. <laughs> <laughs> No, <clears throat> I've had the opportunity, wonderful opportunity to have a career in, uh, at UBC. Uh, and when I first came here uh, in the 1980s, uh, uh, the agricultural sciences faculty had uh, animal facilities and plant, and plant facilities on campus. And so it really was the agricultural uh, uh, campus and food production was uh, very much part of the uh, faculty, both from the production side as well as what we call the post farm gate side. So once it's being produced on the, on the farm, <coughs> one of the activities after the farm. And so I thought I'd, before I tell you what I do and what our program does, I thought I'd just give you a little bit of information about the faculty itself. As you can see here, we're not a very big faculty. We're only about 43 uh, faculty members. Uh, but we have one of the largest uh, undergraduate programs in Canada, uh, about 1,500 students. And we have two very strong programs, uh, one in the applied biology, which is where the UBC farm resides, and is very much interested in the production systems of food coming from animal, plant, and fish. And we have what's called the post-farm gate activities, such as food, nutrition, and health. Uh, we offer three um, BSCs in both food, nutrition, health, biology, and resource uh, programs. And we have graduate programs in the Masters of Science. We have some professional programs in, at the master's level. And we also have PhD programs. So we are a complement of the required research activities for graduate studies as well as teaching undergraduate uh, students. This just gives you an idea of some of the programs in food, nutrition, health, and some of the members that are there. Uh, our food science, not to be confused with food services, but food science uh, started in about 1969 and basically has uh, evolved in looking at food safety and uh, uh, product development. We have a wine research center uh, along with a dietetics program a human nutrition program and a food resource economics program. And the dietetics and the food science programs are both accredited. The food science, for example, is accredited with the international food technologists. So all our graduates have to uh, maintain and step, uh, obtain accreditation in order to work in the food industry. This is some uh, example of our research activities. At the present time, we, we change as, as things go along, but <clears throat> we're very heavily and committed in the food safety and sustainability area, food security. Uh, we have some very uh, good, young, uh, active food microbiologists and chemical toxicologists in our program. We also have some very good uh, food engineers and uh, that are very much interested in in food quality and, and food processing. Uh, the nutrition group is made up of people who are studying the biochemistry of nutrients, not just food, but nutrients specifically as they relate to human health 
And we have a very active program in international nutrition where we look at nutritional standards in uh, developing countries such as Cambodia. So that's a little bit about the faculty. <clears throat> and if you'd like to get more information, uh, the, the web uh, page will tell you quite a bit about it and uh, the different faculty members and the different programs. And you'll, you'll get quite a bit of information on, on individual activities of the faculty members and the staff. But I wanted to spend this time to give you a little bit of uh, perspective on the topic of food security, a very topical, important topic that uh, is um, on the lips of everybody as we become more and more aware about how important food is. And food security has been a, uh, sort of the underlying theme of a lot of the research and teaching activities that we do in the food science program. Because uh, we're pretty much concerned about the quality of our food from the standpoint of sensory quality, organoleptic quality, nutritional quality, and safety, particularly safety. Uh, <clears throat> some of our I mean, we worry a lot about smoke uh, and cured products, the meat products, such as yesterday. But the number one uh, concern is microbial contamination and foodborne illness. And if you go to the Canadian regulatory agency and you ask them the list in terms of priorities, it'll be a microbiology, number one. Food additives is number six. If you have to ask the consumers, it'll be food additives, number one, microbiology, number six. So it's, uh, it's very important that we, we identify uh, ways that we can maintain a safe food system. So I just wanted to spend a little bit of time uh, informing you and discussing with you some of the elements of food uh, security as it relates to the things that we do. Uh, when we look at the definition of food security, the first thing is affordability. <clears throat> Everyone has the right to access a food. And uh, quality of food is something that you take for granted. Um, it's an expectation that food is safe and has high nutritional quality. It's not like a medicine where you're willing to take a side effect. You put your trust in the food system. So affordability, and that's really dependent a lot, in fact, a lot about the household purchase power. Other than that, we have the cues, uh, sensory cues, and I'm sure when all of us go to the supermarket, pick out our vegetables and fruits, we look at certain cues. We look to see if the apples are nice shape, certain color, and are there any spoilage areas or any softness associated with texture. These are extremely important disco, what we call disco cues. And when we cook our food, uh, the minute we bring it into our palate and start chewing, we get the proximal cues. Of, taste, texture, flavor, and smell. So uh, we, in the process of understanding food systems, we need to be able to find ways to maintain those uh, sensory qualities uh, as it relates to the qual overall quality of the food system. Nutritional aspects, well, this is obvious. We all expect good nutrition in our food. We have recommended uh, allowances and nutritional guidelines set for us in terms of our macronutrients, and we trust that our food system it, uh, delivers those nutrients. In addition, we have functional attributes, and many of us uh, take this for granted, particularly uh, if we don't understand the fact that uh, a latte in the morning with that nice foam on top is really a, an a attribute of the functionality between the air bubbles uh, mixing with the weight protein, uh, the nature proteins that you steam up when you, when you make your lactate. So the functionality of the food system provides a lot of the uh, sensory qualities that we, we attribute to our, our uh, food system in, in general. And last but not least, but extremely important, is that food needs to be safe. <clears throat> uh, when we talk about safety, we talk about microbial safety, both with food pathogens, lots of information and topical discussion on E. coli, salmonella, listeria, for example. But in addition, we have chemical residues that we're very much concerned about and need to be aware of. And we have to establish standards to ensure that there are no tolerable effects associated with those residue levels. 
So a lot of <coughs> information about pesticide residues, antibiotic residues, <coughs> even residue, residues that are derived on thermal processing or cooking of food are topics of, of interest in, in uh, food safety. If we look at the food security, there are basically four major pillars. The first of all is the accessibility of our food system. As I said, we have, um, <clears throat> we should expect to have access to food. But that is not a given, obviously. And it's very much a level of production, pro, uh, processing, storage, and to maintain not only that food system, but in the quality that is uh, expected for human consumption. We also have distribution issues. And of course, in, in Vancouver, it's not as big an issue because we can get to the grocery stores. But in many parts of Canada where uh, they're a little bit further away from uh, major access areas, it is an issue. And, and that influences the accessibility of that food system. The availability of our food system has a lot to do with distribution in markets and also the climate uh, variability. Again, in North America, uh, we're very fortunate. We have an abundance amount of food. Uh, and uh, probably our biggest concern is maintaining that food and not spoiling it so it, it can be used to its maximum. And certainly in the underdeveloped countries where there's not refrigeration storage uh, processes, such as here, greater spoilage uh, occurs and that impacts on the amount of available food. We have utilization, and this has a lot to do about attitudes, uh, uh, diversity of interest in certain food systems, uh, what is considered poor quality food, a lot of personal uh, beliefs and attitudes about foods, and some of our people in the uh, food nutrition program actually study this very carefully to try to understand the attitudes associated with food consumption and eating behaviors. And last but not least, we have stability. And this um, relates to the quality of the food system. The minute you harvest the food, it's no longer a living organism. <clears throat> the word risk was used by the media, but no one really provided a definition of the risk. So when we look at risk, a risk is the probability times the susceptibility uh, consequences. So the probability of undergoing or being exposed to something and the consequences very much dictate that risk. But under the, under the probability, we have exposure and susceptibility. So if you increase your exposure to something, you're going to increase your risk to something. That does not mean it's a hazard. And that's a key point in the discussion yesterday with the process meets, no one talked about hazards, they just talked about risk. And of course, if you increase your, you choose to increase your consumption of smoked meats or processed meats, you're going to increase your risk. But it does not equate to hazard. So for example, uh, colorectal cancer from uh, processed meats in the world is around 34,000 cases. You compare that to uh, tobacco, it's over a million. You compare that to alcohol, excessive alcohol consumption, it's over 600,000 cases. So when you compare the risks uh, to those, they're very relatively small. So we need to be able to interpret what these terms mean without scaring our consumers or, or basically uh, changing their attitudes if their attitudes are based on safety alone. So I want to give you three good examples. Uh, one is the residues that we get when we barbecue something. Uh, these are called polyaromatic hydrocarbons. And just to let you know, we know what those uh, compounds are. We've identified them. And we've established risk tolerance levels. So the risk is, has been established. And we know at a level of around five micrograms per kilogram, then you're coming close to a potential hazard. So these things are known, and regulatory agencies uh, insist on maintaining these these uh, these, these levels. 
or below those levels. Another good example is the use of irradiation. On the left, you see a, a table that shows the change uh, over 21 days, and TNTC means too numerous to count. This is what happens when you just let a ground beef exposed to ambient uh, conditions. The microflora uh, will grow and you'll get microbial contamination. But if you radiate it, you'll kill those microorganisms and you'll be able to store that meat for a longer time uh, without the risk to microbial contamination. But there is a, there is a risk associated with oxidizing the fats as a process of the irradiation. So it's a two-ended sword, two-sided sword, and the cost-benefit of these processes have to be taken into consideration. Unfortunately, that is the case. They have to. Another very good example is supplementing with vitamin E. This is a very good example of the different isomers of vitamin E in mother's milk versus infant formula. And you can see that infant formula does not represent mother's milk. Regulatory uh, uh, monitoring needs to be done much more carefully on these products in order to um, mirror the uh, com composition of mother's milk. So those are some of the things that we do in the food science program and the food nutritional program in plant food systems. And basically, uh, along with that, there is a number of regulatory uh, and extra uh, regulatory agencies such as World Health, uh, Food Quality and Safety Standards, HACCP, which are all based on maintaining a food system, a safe food system. The consequence is that maybe food uh, costs go up when you, is, when you regulate it to a level of um, very close absolute safety. So in conclusion, I just wanted to give you a few things to think about. Uh, food security is made up of a number of very important issues. Uh, food safety and quality are very close to the uh, vital nature of food security. And we can use this risk-benefit equation to uh, decide on whether or not uh, the process is meaningful or um, too much of a risk associated with human health. Uh, there are basically two things we have here in terms of health risks. Uh, what do we call health risks, which is reduction in health risks, and that is basically our lifespan and our quality of life. And the second is non-health benefits, which really dictate the economy and the convenience factor, and that, of course, is related to uh, financial aspects associated with food. Those two things need to be balanced not only by the consumer, but by the food industry in order to make it a perfect system. Thank you very much.